We are streaming tonight. Give me one second. I just, I'm going to grab something that uh, we don't see here while we get started. Let some people join in. Left my light over here, looks like. And I need that light because the light is awesome. All right. Let's go defense. Defense all the way. Never be offensive, Maya. <laughs> so. <clears throat> all right. So new system tonight. If you guys are watching right now, I strongly recommend via Instagram, check it out on YouTube. It's going to be a new experience, I will say. And a good experience. We have multi-angle camera stuff going on and should be fun. Um, so tonight, obviously, if you guys can see my face, it's it's fairly sunburnt. Um, we had a few things happen this week. River dropped from 40,000 CSF, which is massive, to a more palatable 20. Um, starting to see caddis here in Northern California. And a ton of fun stuff going down. So I got the pleasure of fishing with my friend Nick from Foley Mill Flies today, and we went out and got sunburned and hooked some trout. Uh, so trying to zoom in on you guys over here. So today we're going to be tying some, Bill, what's up, man? Awesome t-shirt. Yes. It's a decent t-shirt. Has a guy with a fish beard. Uh, great reminder that I forgot to switch it around, so my smartphone's going to try to trip out and watch that the whole time. So we're tying two flies. One is going to be ultimately just a, in a tractor pattern. Um, actually, they kind of both are. But this one, one's going to be kind of more March Brownie. Um, one's kind of a play on a really traditional fly. So show you a few colorways in one of the flies and uh, we'll just take it from there. Um, so the bird's nest. <laughs> is a ultra classic pattern. I don't care where you fish, what you fish for, you need to have uh, bird's nests in your in your vise. So what we're gonna do is we'll switch over and we're gonna jump in and take a look at the vise. Um, and again, if you guys wanna see more angles and more stuff, jump on our YouTube live stream. We're gonna have three camera angles and it's a little bit more advanced than the old Instagram. Also high definition now. So that's kind of cool. So this is a, mm, I would say this is like a 3.2 mil or 3.8 mil tungsten slotted bead by hairline. Happens to be in a hot orange color and I'm gonna be throwing this on a fire hole uh, or on a fire hole stick 516. I am tying this in a size 10 tonight. Um, you can feel free to tie it all the way from like an 8 to a 20 if you wanted to. So, catching up on some comments here. No, 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 no love being in live videos. Sorry, guys. We got to keep it focused here. I have really bad ADD, as you know. Um, so, um, I'm going to use a little bit of 0.15 non lead. Tungsten bead's pretty heavy. I'm not really looking to make this thing a rocket ship. So I like the, the non-lead wire. Obviously, it's environmentally friendly. And it's not going to contaminate your waterways, which is a, a really positive thing. So I do about six wraps of that. Um, and again, I'm going to actually tie two of these. I'm going to tie them in my two favorite colors. And... Um, both are going to be size 10s though, and I'll just explain the difference on how to manipulate this. What is being tied? Um, kind of a more modern spin on a very old pattern called a bird's nest. Um, and I pulled out some vintage materials for this, if you guys can see this. This bag of lemon wood duck was a buck twenty-five at some point in life. Um, I don't remember where I bought that, but I bought a lot of it. <laughs> so... Yes, Curtis, I'm on YouTube now. I'm, uh, it's getting bigger, man. 
and hopefully the video quality is the best that you've seen brother so I'm just gonna go ahead and start and we'll just wrap I wrap my thread base down and then I'm gonna go ahead and wrap through my wire just creating and it's gonna squeak but I will fix that right now for you guys that hate the squeaking we'll do a, a nose trick and now it won't squeak now my nose is probably white <laughs> so yeah, Cal, Cal's bird's nest, like I tell you, greens, blacks, tans, browns, like every flavor of color, hot bead, gold bead, black bead, olive bead, uh, it doesn't seem to matter. It's a small little buggy pattern and seems to catch fish. Um, if lemon wood duck is something you don't want to spend money on, and I like it just because it blends in and matches, um, but once you start tying other colors, just some traditional mallard is going to be absolutely amazing so if you guys can't tell obviously along with uh video quality is excellent on youtube awesome bill i appreciate it that's what we were hoping for brother um along with my my sunburn that i received today i also received my allergies because i think spring is officially here in northern california um so i'm not going to really worry about you know having three tails or anything like that on this pattern and I'm gonna wrap that forward and I'm just gonna use a little bit of it to create my ramp um, you'll see a lot of birds nests out there they're tied super bulky um, and that's 100% not what you want um, this is meant to be a ultra sparse delicate light pattern um, very suggestive of in nature You love the wood duck. Let's see. Yeah, nose trick, it's a real thing. Especially after you've been like out sweating all day. I'm sure you have some extra nose lubrication. Um, so this is a... I'll show you guys what I'm using here. This is an ultra wire in brassy and just in a brown color. I'm, it's just for segmentation. I'm, I'm not over the top concerned with everything there it's gonna work great and what I do is I'm gonna tie this in and I'll turn this up for the camera to see so I'm gonna tie it down the side because mayflies are traditionally flatter than they are tall and not that I think it's gonna make a tremendous world of difference but um, I also don't I, I stop just short of like right back here because that's where our first dubbing wraps are gonna go um, for this, I, I am going to stray a little bit away from like kind of the tradition in, um, especially right now we have a little bit of runoff, water's off color everywhere. Um, you know, some places probably flowing clear, but it's not summer flows. So you can also switch this up and go, I'm using an ice dub in uh, UV tan. It's a great color, represents a ton of different bugs. Um, I also, my next one I'm going to tie is going to be a dark olive. And I'll explain to you guys the trick of, the, of ice dubs as well. Um, because if you look at this, it looks blue. It doesn't make any sense, and that's just kind of going to be a thing. Wyco Flyco, what's up, dude? Way better on the YouTubes. Exactly, exactly. And we have multi-camera angle, which I'm really stoked about. Um, so, I can show you guys this up top here. But what I do every time you bring dubbing out is you want to you wanna work it. It's been jammed in a bag and you just want to make sure that you're getting the you know the material loosened up and ready to be dubbed onto your fly so um, and I'll, ex I'll explain that so good tip um, I say this a lot in videos and I forget who I learned it from I think it was Andy Burke who was a infamous Northern California tire way way back in the day is I want to press hard enough on my dubbing noodle to push the color out of my nail beds and that's going to be a solid dubbing noodle there. What's up? I'm trying to see. Similar to a Prince fly? Um, no, it's. I mean, it's kind of a. It's kind of a retro esque standard staple pattern for a lot of fly companies to tie. Um, I don't think it's as synonymous as a Prince nymph is. Um, it's a little bit more representational of actual aquatic insects versus you know princes are kind of 
it's in a tractor pattern, but uh, not much, man. Mostly sunburn and suffering from hay fever, but happy to have caught some fish today. So I'm going to go ahead and take this, and I'm just going to do one wrap there, and then I'm going to move my wire back. And by doing that, that's going to be my counter rib, and make sure that I have a really bomb-proof fly. So you can see this 50D is pretty darn slippery by itself, but once you press in there, and I'm going to build a little bit heavier of a collar, I don't mind, um, just because I'm going to fill that void. So you can see we now have our wire sticking out. Like right here, it's in a perfect spot. Um, <clears throat> but Chile, what's up, man? Delaware Pro, what's up? What's up? Uh, let's see, JB Fly Fishing. He's making a bird's nest. Sorry, I missed that. Thank you for catching it for me. You guys are the best. Self-governing question and answer segment. Um, so I'm going to take this guy, and I'm going to go ahead and just start wrapping through. I actually wish I would have had this on the river today because apparently they were eating some light colored bug. Um, and I'm going to take this all the way up even though we're going to work back over it. I just think it just creates a little bit more durability in my pattern. Not a big issue if you don't want to do it that way. Do some around the worlds. If I could get that song to queue up every time I did that, it would be probably even more comical, but that's just life. Uh, what's the best way to use this pattern? Great question, great question. Um, so I, I fish this either on a tight line, um, traditionally, like our high sticking Euro nymphing, comp nymphing, um, Spanish style nymphing, whatever sort of thing where you're just holding the rod and you're holding it out. Uh, that works great. Um, good level of connectivity there, but you could also use this um, via like an indicator uh, so pretty much sky's the limit but it's just a subsurface pattern so however you want to get it to the bottom that's the way to use this fly so you can see I'm moving back and I'm just kind of creating a, like a thorax here <coughs> an area for my legs to go in now for your legs I'm just gonna go ahead and pull out uh, or off uh, about 10 to 12 strands again we're not doing three legs it's not science um, my old ad adage is trout don't count. They've never had a formal education. So just some suggestive legs on there are gonna do wonders for you. So you can see, I always like to refer to things as if I'm looking at the fly this way, the top of my fly is 12 o'clock, so we threw those in at a three, and we're gonna throw the second set in at a nine. And again, 10 little wood duck feathers over here and I push my legs on just to make sure that they land and they're kind of even, super sparse, which is great. And this is going to be where we can throw our thorax in. Fly Fiend, what's up, brother? How's, how's life in Canada? The Will Walker, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, what is this fly called again? This is a bird's nest, but it's actually a variation. So traditionally, they're not tied on a jig hook. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in jig hooks. I want a few more legs there. Um, and I can explain that a little bit. I, fish, I, uh, I guide two clients on a regular basis. They're five and seven. And they land more fish on jig hooks. So if that doesn't... Uh, that's just my belief. I love jig hooks. So... Uh, yeah, it's just a bird's nest, typically not a hot bead, typically not uh, using ice stub. It's a very traditional old pattern. The woody flank, yeah, it is. It is a, you know, it's one of those treats that you can get from your buddies that are willing to sit in a marsh for uh, like a whole winter while you're out steelheading. I bought the ones here, but I do have some from the buddies. <laughs> so... Um, you don't have to do a collar of a different color. Um, I think it just adds like a transition point. So cool colors that you can add are peacock black and another color that uh, there's kind of a, a few of them that I just believe in and I'll hold them up here for you guys. So we have the ice dub tan like we're using, peacock black, ice dub in brown, 
and a UV dark olive. So I'm going to use these two colors. I'll tie another variation here. So I'm just going to pull out just a little bit of uh, jig hook equals brand new fly. Absolutely. I've coined this and now it's my fly. I'll accept all royalties and uh, thank you much. No, not really. Um, it just actually helps you hook fish and but uh, I know you're giving me a, a good ribbon right there, Mr. Mr. Franklin. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and dub through, make a cool dark little collar, creating a transition. And this is where you could incorporate the whip finisher. Uh, don't use one. <laughs> Watching me whip finish is probably about the same as most of us trying to go out and ice skate. Unless you're a hockey player. So the one place I do like to use some resin, this is uh, an unlabeled bottle of Thin. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in the back of the fly just to kind of solidify and cure into the uh, bead there. It's just a f finalization. I use it a lot like a head cement. So... <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm going to do kind of the same thing. I'm going to tie this in olive just to kind of explain some of the subtle differences. And plus, because these are pretty quick flies, so at 16 minutes, I want to make sure, you know, you guys get some of your money's worth here because you've you've paid so much to be here with your uh, personal time that I appreciate it. So we got to put on a good show. Um, this so when I tie these in olive, I tie them a lot uh, a lot smaller than this, although um, it would work just fine any way you want uh, or size that you want but uh, typically I'm tying these in 16s and 18s and more so to represent maybe even a 14 pretty big for like a betas um, I do love myself quite a bit so I won't tie them in 20s because that's pretty rugged um, hats off to the guys that you know put that tiny fly on a dime and they're like haha look at what I've tied I'm like you guys are out of control um, so again with the 0.15 wire. Um, the material for the legs and such is <coughs> wood duck. And a, a wood duck has a barred feather like most ducks except for it comes in this really cool natural color. Now they're, ex they're a little bit more on the expensive end so they do, uh, I know like Hairline and quite a few other companies do make a product that is uh, mallard dyed wood duck. Um, you know, so then you're dropping down to like a dollar or two a bag of feathers. Um, so that's a little bit more palatable if you're going to be filling a box with these. Well, let's see. Uh, great question, Bobby. So Bobby asked if you guys can't see, do all the color variations make a difference on these flies? Um, and absolutely, I think yes. Um, great example today, we were throwing a very dark nymph pattern. Um, and a, you know, a, I changed one shade of like different patterns and it went from an occasional fish to a greater number of activity. You have to remember that, um, I don't know. I, I think it depends on clarity and stuff like that and bugs that are hatching. Um, size is also a tremendously important option here. So if the bugs that are coming off are like a really small like size 18 caddis or something like that, um, you know, and you're throwing a size 12, sometimes, you know, you might, depends on your fishery, but sometimes you might lose a few fish that route. <clears throat> So, I don't know, I think uh, I think a lot of the times too, like having a hot bead on there, um, kind of takes something that's a drab suggestive pattern and turns it into more of an attractor pattern as well. So, um, like if I showed you guys like my bag of different, I mean, colors of beads that I'm rocking, I mean, it's, you know, it's taking slight variance, uh, variances and, you know, manipulating. Um, and a lot of times I will change um, my, bead size on the same size hook to change my sink rates, especially if uh, I am, you know, high sticking or using, trying not to use a split shot or something. Um, so this is, this is going to be not wood duck. Um, this is the more economical version. 
Um, you know, there's a few things out there that I love, which are like wood ducks and bronze mallards, but you know, you don't have to do that. Mexico City, what's up, man? I dig the YouTube video. Awesome. I just made jig flies great again. <laughs> oh, man. It's weird. It's funny. You're right. I mean, uh, everybody's going to a jig, and it makes it makes too much sense, man. I love jig hooks. It provides mechanical advantage. It's just goofy that way. So I'll move through this one just a little bit quicker, but still... Um, <clears throat> provide some information so as you can see I'm I'm definitely not you know setting the world on fire with like bright colors in this one this this fly is going to be significantly more drab um, but that's okay so again I'm going to tie my wire in over here on the side um, what's really interesting is so like sometimes for various fishing applications um, see if I have it right here. That one. No. I thought I had. Uh, but this will help me in my explanation. Um, I'm trying to look for some hot colored stuff. I mean, I'll even come in here and tie like a sherbet colored. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so, let's see. Can you catch crappy with crappy with flies? Crappies, <laughs> yeah. Fly life seven seventy five. What's up, brother? Um, you know, hot oranges, hot colors. You you can add like super hot hot stuff to them. Um, the way the lighting set up, it's going to be really hard. But I'll explain ice dubbing to you. Um, this is blue. When you hold it up versus the light, it's actually light gray. So you always want to look at your ice stubs in a like a negative space, like you're using them to cover the sun, and you hold them up, and you're going to get a different colorway. Let me see if I can. I don't know how to do that. Um, so this olive again looks like kind of this weird, off greenish blue color. It's I, I struggled with it forever, but when you hold it up to the light, it's it's going to be like this cool dark, dark, deep olive color. So. Nothing wrong with fishing the bottoms. Um, do jig hooks really work better? I don't have like hard scientific evidence for you. My goodness. Um, blowing up here. So, um, but my five and seven year old, like, you know, they're sitting there and they're like back reeling, reeling forward, putting the rod tip to the fish. Um, there's, there's no rhyme or reason. And when we switched over to jig hooks, Granted, they weren't, they were like much younger than, um, probably like five and three. And yes, I have a three year old on a drift boat. Um, he's a pretty special kid. Um, he's grown up on it. So I noticed that they just started landing. Either they're, the fish are very forgiving because they know it's a, a tiny human on the other end, or um, the jig hooks did make a difference. But I've been fishing jig hooks probably almost nine years now. They're just far more popular. I've, I've always enjoyed them. <clears throat> so this bug definitely doesn't look olive in a positive light, but in a negative light, which is like what the fish would see. Say if it's close to bottom, fish is sitting on bottom in the easy water. Um, it's definitely going to have a, a, a you know dark olive translucent nature to it. I did pick a more muted bead. <laughs> bait, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, bait fish patterns. I mean, crappie will catch uh, a ton of stuff. And um, yeah, give them a try. See what it happens. I personally think um, another big misconception, like a lot of you guys probably know, I um, I snorkel rivers, and everybody goes, "Oh, a jig hook just rides perfectly with this on the bottom." Totally not true. They still wo wobble and move around quite a bit. Um, at least in my experience. Every situation might be different depending on the turbidity of the water. But it's just kind of what I've learned in my, my research, I'll call it. They do seem to snag up quite a bit less.
yeah, give them a try. I mean, you kind of got to get some special beads. I mean, not 100%, but, uh, you know, the tungsten slotted beads definitely are helpful. They do sit right, and they do counterbalance the fly quite well. <clears throat> So you can see you have like a nice little leg spread there, um, nice and even. So here you can go with like an iced up brown, and again, iced up brown looks pretty blue, but it's, I can assure you, it's definitely a brown color. Um, you can do blends of this, you can use naturals, I mean you can use rabbit for this, uh, kind of a hare's ear-esque pattern, but just a nice little darker nymph. Um, and with like this 4.0 mil bead that I have on here right now, you can absolutely run this up to like a 14, 16. It, it's not going to hurt you. The fish aren't bead shy. Um, I'm sure there's a few waterways where they might be, but uh, for the most part, I'll tie the same fly. Say if we're tying a size, say if we're tying a size 10, I'll tie, you know, like a 3 mil, a 4 mil, and heck, even a 5 mil, just to obtain different depths with that. All right, so weight also, yes, yes. Um, Bobby asks a great question, and because I don't work for the Department of Fish and Game, I'm a little leery to ask it, but typically um, the way that I govern, say if there's small bodies of water that are flowing into a known, a known body of water, um, let's just say, for example, there's a tributary to <clears throat> the McLeod River or something like that. I'm going to go follow the McLeod River regs because if the McLeod River is closed from this date to this date for, you know, brown trout spawn, uh, you know, rainbow spawning, etc., I'm just going to kind of follow down that rabbit hole um, and try to uh, make it so that I'm not going to get in any trouble. <laughs> Let's see, hold on. What's up, guys? What's up? What's up? Marcio, what's up? Juan, what's up? What's up? Johnny, Bobber Neon, hello, hello. Your nymphing video. Yes, Trout Bum. Um, so, you kind of get a cool little pattern, and again, it looks really. Uh, what's up, Mario? Um, you get a cool little pattern, it looks really great. Um, it's going to be olives and browns because as you know, mayflies get into the thorax, it's going to be a little bit darker. Um, you know, that's kind of why I go to the blacks and dark, some of the darker colors like that. Um, it just depends on what I want to do. Nice heavy fly. It's going to get down, catch fish, and they're, they're pretty fairly easy to tie in the grandiose scheme of things. So the next one is kind of just a generic mayfly pattern and I was using these mottled brown beads and I think I used them all up at the uh, Confluence fly shop. I was just up there teaching a little class. Whoa, holy goodness. Uh, those don't work in Canada. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Bottling between three different live stream areas is always fun. Could I use partridge for the bar, uh, bar, barred feather? Absolutely. If you guys have a plethora of cool colored dyed partridge feathers, be my guest. Um, yeah, jig flies are super uh, universal. Do you go by bright sky, bright pattern, and vice versa? Um, you know, for like my nymphing, a lot of times our regs allow us to run triple nymph rig. And if I'm out on a boat with friends and they want to nymph fish or they're, you know, that's, we're just looking to go nymphing. Um, I'll typically run something that's attracting, uh, something that's light, and then something that's dark. So I try to cover all the bases. It's like, imagine if your nymph rig was a sizzler, if you guys remember that, or I don't know what the most, uh, recent... Um, <laughs> buffet would be. I don't frequent them. So say we're in Las Vegas and we're at the Bellagio and we're eating the buffet or something. 
you know, I want to give them every option. It's just kind of my, my philosophy on it. Um, and from there, if you're fishing, especially if you're fishing a new body of water, from there you're able to take that and, um, oh wow, this fish ate this brown bug. Like, that fish ate the brown bug, that fish ate the brown bug. All of a sudden the brown bug becomes the bug. So maybe you put a slightly different brown bug on or go more muted or um, it's basically like imagine it's just like a gauge. Um, it's kind of like being able to like call people that uh, have been at the uh, the buffet. <laughs> so I, I kind of just run a triple rig again in a tractor something neutral typically a lot of times it might be like a big rubber legs um, and then something like oh I see a lot of cinnamon caddis coming off so I'm gonna run it like a cinnamon pattern. It just it just varies until I figure out that waterway. Um, so in the vise, this is just this happens to be a cool little five sixteen or sorry <coughs> a seven seven eighteen size sixteen. I'm confusing myself. Um, and this is glow bright floss. Um, and this stuff is really cool. I know that UV lights don't ever show up well as far as video goes, but you guys should be able to see that this thing glows like a crazy um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna build my tag in and I don't mind that UV uh, fluorescence being underneath my body I really don't so this stuff does kind of have a tendency to fray and um, it's a little, you can see it's a little bit more delicate of a material, so I just treat it as such. So when I start my thread, I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I secure that in there as best as possible. <clears throat> and now this is a very untraditional, that got all wiggly, what's going on there? We'll fix that. We'll do a few wraps, it'll go away. Um, so this is kind of an untraditional tailing material. Um, let's see, make sure. Chris, right on, man. Good luck. <laughs> Cheers. Good luck at work, brother. <laughs> um, on this one, I didn't. You definitely can. Um, I typically, I typically run my .15 non-lead. Um, like I said, sometimes ADD gets the best of me, and I would say that's what happened in this scenario. Um, so when I buy a patch of pheasant, you're gonna guys are gonna notice that there's quite a few feathers, and down here at the back, um, these are the good ones. These guys, these guys at the back here, are, these are like my steelhead fly patches, stuff like that. Um, so what I do is I kind of just pop into the middle here. It's an easy strip. Um, but I'm going to try to find the most level section and I'll, and again, trout aren't counting the tail fibers. If I lose a few, got a few extras. Um, so what I've noticed is I take about a half, you know, three eighths to a half inch and I'm just going to go ahead and lightly set those in there. They may seem super long, but mayfly tails are traditionally pretty long in nature. Like these little short stubby tail guys, um, you know, it might be out there, but I think it also helps the nymph to kick and swim, grabs more current, creates false movement in your fly, and just is pretty cool to look at. So this is a cool product. It's called Body Quill. Yeah, getting fuzz in my nose. Never fun. Um, it comes in a bazillion different colors. So if you're tying this fly, you know, again, it's all olives, browns, blacks, yellows, little stone flies. Um, and I take off about, you know, 12 inches of this. Um, and the reason I do that is because it takes forever to palmer this all the way through if it's a single strand. And I'm not complete. I know Cheech has done it a few times. He's far more tricky with his Sasquatch hands than I am. So, uh, I don't typically run it in a bobbin. The bacon dropper. <laughs> Oh man. But yeah, if you want to heavy this up a bit, you can put, you know, an, a bigger heavy duty underbody in here for sure. Um, 
So what I do is I start with my body quill and I'm just going to go ahead and wrap. I move kind of quick, um, mostly because I'm going to go back and forth. So I can build up to my thorax very simply and the more wraps that you get the more uh, opaque I guess you would say that it comes or the stronger the color becomes. If I want to get a little bit more I don't mind wrapping all the way up here. Um, it's just going to make a bomber fly. I don't want to waste the material. I'm not incredibly worried about it. Um, which, which would be kind of traditionally how an insect would look. Um, obviously the thinner sections of a mildly translucent insect will have more pass through of light. <clears throat> so I'm going to take about a third of the body excluding the head. So, uh, that's where our thorax is going to lay in. Um, and here you guys can use anything you want. You can use a scud back. You can use, um, I'm going to use a nice piece of turkey and I just like that. Um, turkey's cool. It has a lot of cool modeling. Um, some of this like more prime stuff up here I use for muddlers. You know if it has all super equal tips. So sometimes I come down into this little this little flat section that you guys can see. It's more towards the base of the feather. Uh, we'll just go ahead and get a bit of trim. And for this, I probably took enough for two, so we'll save that for my next one. And I just like to pull the tips. So feather, feathers and stuff like that, a lot of them are like zippers. Uh, they do zip back together. That's how those guys make those really cool married wings. Um, I don't know if nature intended it that way, but you can zip three different flavors of feather together. And guess what? You get a you know three colored wing segment. That's a uh, tricky, tricky scenario. Um, <clears throat> So this is a, just kind of a pre-made little blend. It's some hairs here and some ice dub uh, mixed in there. This is an SLF dub from Dave Whitlock. It's a uh, red squirrel nymph thorax. So it's got kind of a rainbow effect and some spiky stuff sticking out of it. And again, synthetics looks like some, maybe it's squirrel, maybe it's rabbit. Looks kind of squirrely. Um, and then a few SLF fibers in there, like synthetic living fibers or, tr you know, STS trilobal fiber. Um, so you guys can make some pretty awesome blends here. Um, it's a buggy, buggy little creature here. And that's fine. And you can see I'm really focusing right in this area. <clears throat> so for me and my tying, I don't know if you guys will be able to pick this up on, on the camera, but there is an iridescence that hits right about there. I know you're going to see it on YouTube, um, but um, I like that. The pheasant has a natural UV spectrum, uh, kind of like peacock does and a few others. <laughs> so I like to try to capitalize on that. What I do is I come up here and I just trim out and I'm going to select how many legs do I need. I'm missing a few on this side, so I might add a few extra legs in. Not a major issue. So what's cool is once you cut that V out, you'll see it almost puts it in perfect position to wrap in, and you're going to get some cool little legs in there. I know a lot of the comp guys don't like adding legs. It adds to drag and... I'm going to go ahead and just kind of manipulate those apart. But uh, I just offset that as best as possible with bigger tungsten beads and more, more underbody <laughs> if you need to. Um, so there's a workaround for everything in life. And, you know, sometimes a good buggy suggestive fly really gets that job done. So you can see this is a really thin wing case once I pull it. Like that material really shrinks down. <clears throat> so there's a trick here obviously you guys have seen that I tie it with white thread so I'm just going to use a Copic marker and 
I'm gonna go ahead and make my, my thread wraps brown, just covering my tracks. Let's see. I've been, who makes that hat? Um, that's a loon hat. It's our old nocturnal hat. Um, I'm not wearing the uh, most freshest of gear, I apologize. So, so when I do wing cases, I, I turn my light on first and I'll typically hold it out of the way. And I'll go ahead and just put it on there and I'll hit it with the light. Thanks Mario, appreciate it brother. It's fire. It's a good hat. And I'm just going to kind of continuously build my wing case here just with the lightest amount of resin possible. And I don't mind curing in steps like this. It's, it takes no time. Um, and you're going to get a good durable wing case. And the last trick, if, if you need to and you want more bubble, I'll show you. I forget who showed me this, but you turn it upside down. And since gravity works against everything, you can probably see some of that underbody starting to glow too. It's kind of cool. But there we go. <clears throat> so at this point, we're going to go ahead and come in and we'll just kind of work through this fly. And I'm going to trim underneath here. Not for any good reason, but just because I don't want all that straggle there. But you're going to get this really cool little pattern. You can start to see some of that orange pop through underneath. That's fine. Light underbody. In my opinion is it's going from light to a darker, light to dark. Um, some of the best trout lures in the world. <laughs> um, if you ever study those things, one side's dark typically, or and one side has a, a lot lighter area. So... Awesome, dude. I can't wait. I would uh, love to see some pictures. Tag us with some fish if you catch some fish in uh, in Argentina, in Patagonia. So that's just my little downtown brown fly. Um, it's not like a March brown pattern. I mean, I guess it could be. Um, it's just brown and has a heavy bead, so it goes to the bottom. So it goes downtown. Um, I'm not the coolest name guy ever. The, we'll give that to somebody else. So, but that's about all that I have for you guys today. And let's see here. There we go. Um, new transitions on YouTube. I'll show you guys the last one. It's even cooler. Watch if you're on YouTube. We have this one. And um, it's pretty cool. You get to see my hands um, and see what I'm doing. Didn't come into play because we weren't building dubbing loops and stuff tonight. But uh um, anyways, next time guys, hey, if you're on if you're on Instagram, hop on over to our YouTube. It's going to be streaming high def straight to your phone um, and multi-camera angles, which are super cool. So hopefully these have helped you out a little bit. Hopefully they help you pick up a few fish here as, as we get into spring. And hope to see you guys on the next adventure. Thank you for watching.